My brethren, peace of the Lord. I invite the church to stand up. I'm going to ask praise group what, um, what the message is going to be. In the Bible, of course. <laughs> of course it's going to be there. He w who was here on Sunday school? They have already given a uh, tip in Nehemiah 2.2. 2. Nehemiah 2, chapter 2, verse 2. Verses actually 11, 12. And Nehemiah 2, verses 11, 12. And the word of the Lord says the following. Nehemiah 2, verse 11, 12. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. Amen. The church may be seated. My brethren, we are speaking a lot about the book of Nehemiah. Last year, we spoke a lot about Revelations, the church, the history of the church, the beginning of the church, the entire trajectory of the church until our days. We spent uh, more than a year, almost two years, in the book of Revelations, speaking exactly about the Im Im importance and the role of the church in the world. And this year, the Lord has instructed us to speak about the book of Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah is a book that speaks about the restoration the reconstruction of Jerusalem. It's completely connected to the church. It has everything to do with my life and your life, our spiritual life. Because when we study Nehemiah, we see the role of Nehemiah, we see how he entered in Jerusalem, in the way he saw the city, we see the behavior of Nehemiah. And when we see uh, in the already in the first chapters of Nehemiah, we'll see that the servant of God needs to be bold, valiant. The servant of God, in order to be a part of the project, to be part of a, a work that is being done by the Holy Spirit, in the midst of the church, in the midst of the environment, uh, evangelical environment, and in the midst of Christianity, the servant needs to have a commitment with the Father. He needs to have roots. He needs to want. He needs to fight. He needs to let go of everything and fight for his blessing. Because if that person doesn't do this, if that person doesn't have in their heart the desire, a desire greater than the desire to sin, if they don't have in their heart the desire greater than the desire that many times come up in, humanly speaking, in a rational thought, if they don't have this desire, this hope for Jerusalem, they will not see Jerusalem. When we see Nehemiah, we see that exists, there is salvation for men. 
we see that there is hope for man. There is an opportunity that God is giving to man. But he needs to want. The word says that when he came to Jerusalem and he stayed there for three days, three days speak uh, has a prophetic meaning. It speaks of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It speaks of the death. It speaks of the historical aspect. And the resurrection of Jesus speaks of the prophetic aspect. And what is important for the church is not the death of Jesus, not the cross in itself, not what he went through, what he subjected himself to, but what happened on the third day. For the church, what is important is the prophetic, and what is beyond the death, and what is beyond the history, and what is beyond the letter. The church needs to leave this in order for us to enter into Jerusalem. I'm not speaking about the geographic Jerusalem, the seat of Jerusalem there in Israel. No, I'm speaking about the spiritual Jerusalem. In order for man to enter into Jerusalem, man needs to live a miracle of the third day. Man needs to understand the miracle of the third day. Man needs to leave the historical let go of the death of Jesus because many out there they stopped on the death of Jesus many out there the world the Christian world the evangelical world they only speak about the death of Jesus but the primitive church had a message the message was Jesus resurrected Jesus was victorious on the third day he resurrected. That was the message of the primitive church. And this is also our message. And the same Jesus that resurrected on the third day, he one day will, he will return to take the faithful church to be with him. And at night, so I came uh, at night, and me and a few men with me. And then now I ask to the brethren here in the night, is that a good time for you to get up? You, we, you arise in the morning. Nobody arise at night. Only those who are a little overweight, they go to the freezer where everybody's sleeping. They go there and eat uh, the sweets and everything. But normally, men, human beings, they get up in the morning and but there are a few that like to get up at noon. And at night, then I rose in the night, and I and a few men with me. The servant of, of the Lord has to be valiant. He has to arise at night. And the night speaks of the prophetic moment in which we're living. A night speaks of this spiritual time, the time of God that the, the world is living in now. is the time of danger, is the time of the uncertainty, the time of the fear, the time of the agony, the time of suffering, where the beasts they attack, where the victims are attacked. That's why there is fear in the night. That's why the time in God's clock, the church of this time, it lives in the period of the night where we see the uncertainty in the world. You don't know how, what is going to happen tomorrow. You don't know about the economy. You don't know if you're going to have a job tomorrow or if you're going to be fired or if, if tomorrow is going to be all right or if, or if a car comes and hit you. We all live in this life of uncertainty of this suffering. Is it possible that my son is going to go to school and he'll be able to come back home with those crazy people that go to schools armed? We don't know. The father leaves his home without... The family doesn't know if the father is going to go back home. The dangers that we face on the roads of an accident or something happening, this is a moment of uncertainty. 
this is a moment in which the church needs to be active. This is a moment in which the faithful are relaying a message. And this message is that Jesus is coming. And there are but a few. I got up and then I arose and a few men with me. There are only a few do, who do this. The majority doesn't have any commitment with the gospel. The majority doesn't want. They come to the church, they receive their blessing, they receive the deliverance from God, the healings. God restores because God is a, a restorer. A God a, is restore. He restored the marriages, restored the health, and restored the joy. And then man goes away, never comes back. Man, as seldomly a man comes back. But the word says that many are called, but few are chosen. Many have been called, but few are chosen. And with this few, the God is doing a great work. God does not count on men. God is, does not expect anything from men. God wants a sincerity from men. If there is sincerity, if there is a heart that is in need, if there is a heart that is willing to seek the Lord, God is always ready to help men. But they are but a few. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart. My brethren, we live in a world where there is great ingratitude. But tonight, the Lord wants us to leave this place with the knowledge that there is salvation for men. There is hope for men. There is a project that leads men to know Jerusalem, to see Jerusalem restored, to enjoy of what is to be in Jerusalem. There is a project that will lead men to become a citizen of Jerusalem. The world in which we are living the moment of the night where people are living without hope for life. They lost it. And if we look the world around us, what we see on the newspapers, on the news, they're the worst possible. I'm not even speaking about the poor. I'm speaking about the ones who have possessions, the ones who have fame, they have uh, financial means, they are good, people that are well known, people that live in countries called first world countries, people that live in Europe, people that live in the United States, but they are unhappy. People that have success, they have a lot of followers on Twitter, 20,000, 100,000 followers, and sometimes even more. Some people are just trying to, to get a million followers. But the more fame they have, the more success they have, without God in their hearts, the more lack of hope, more anguish, more suffering, more misery. And that's what we see. I'm not speaking about Brazil, because in Brazil we know. Brazilian people is, is happy. The situation is bad, but they are still happy. The government is bad, but they are still happy. Now they are having a big feast there. The situation is horrible, corruption and violence. And you go there and you see. You cannot even watch a movie because you can only play a carnival on the, on the TV. You see? I'm not even talking about Brazil because it's, not impos it's impossible for us to speak about Brazil. Let's speak about a country that considered countries good countries. Let's speak about Japan. Japan is a, a country that is, is greatest balance uh, in socially. There is no poor, there is not, not a poor person in Japan. Uh, it's a country that is 
highly technological. Ten years ago, they are ten years ahead of Brazil in technology, and they are a few years ahead of the United States. You know that the technology in Japan are is greater than in America. They leave the United States behind. When you go there, you are really amazed. It's something it's a different level, cultural, it's everything. When you go to cross the street, there's not a single car passing. Nobody pass unless there is the the green light. But Brazilians are going to be ashamed there. When there is the cross Everybody stop and Brazilian pass alone with the briefcase. There we need to instruct our people in the church. We need to have a little school of good habits. We're gonna receive Japanese here and Brazilian like to embrace and give kisses. Brazilians and there it cannot happen there. That the people have to teach you need to do this. So have like this, you need there is a time, everything is fine. You cannot go beyond the time, you cannot advance the traffic light. It doesn't matter whether the road road is completely empty. And they are all waiting to get a green light and cross the street. It's something unbelievable. Everybody knows. The stores, everybody has access to the technology, the telephones, TVs, the most modern cars. You have access to everything. Health. The, uh, everything in Japan is in high level. Did you know that Japan, with all of it, with all of this facility, all those facilities to live, we are currently with the greatest index of suicide of the youth. The greatest index of suicide of youth in Japan, with all of this that they have access to. So then we can see that men cannot feel the emptiness in their heart. Men cannot satisfy, be satisfied with material things. It's not possible. There's no fame, there's no technology. It's not country, the third largest economy in the world. This will not lead men anywhere. Men will always be miserable. Without God in the heart, without an experience with Jesus, man becomes this that we see out there. Just a beggar. How can you explain criminality in the world? It's not only in Brazil. How can you explain a young lady that scheduled a, a plan with her boyfriend, the death of her parents? They manipulate everything and then they go to the, the wake and they cry. Can you explain a man that spent four hours to beating a woman up? Can you, how can you explain that? Man has no love for life. Man has no hope for anything. What can what man is expecting is only death. And it will come to everyone. There's no age, there's no time. The death when it comes, it's no there's no way for you to run out. You cannot change your name, change your appearance when it comes it comes a few days ago I received a letter from a, a funeral home they sent an email asking me if I have everything ready for my death can you imagine something like that yeah uh, two weeks ago I received an email a funeral home I don't know how they found me what I almost died I didn't think that they have that idea. In their plan in mind. Everything is ready. You can call us. Man, you don't have any rest anymore. I'm going to send you the contact right now so you can look for them. What a horrible thing. There is no peace anymore. 
You're there, you know, daily life and come those attacks from the enemy. <laughs> Horrible thing. And that's what we see. The only assurance that we have, the only hope that we have is death. But Nehemiah, when he found out the situation of Jerusalem, when Nehemiah, he realized, he found out about the situation of Jerusalem, Nehemiah, he felt in his heart a great desire to help his people. And Nehemiah, the word says that he, Nehemiah was a man that lived in the palace with the king. Nehemiah was a man that was catering to the king. They had direct access to the king. He had more access than the king's family. Because the kings in those times, they have all those. All the apparatus, the entourage, people that took care of them. They has this house and the queen has her own house. And that's what we see in the movies. And Nehemiah was the right hand person of the king. Nothing was given to the king before going through the hands of Nehemiah. Food, drink, everything Nehemiah had to try first. He was of the complete trust of the king. And at that time it was a, a very u usual way of killing kings was to poison the kings. You put like a poison on the food, on the drink, and they will poison the king. The resources were, were not so many. The concern of the king was this. And Nehemiah was one of the men that took care of the king. He lived inside of the palace. The fortress, the king was there. Verse 1, chapter 1 says, and, and he lived in the fortress of the king Artaxerxes. And now when it comes the news, and now taken over by the Holy Spirit, Nehemiah Christ, with the situation of Jerusalem, with the situation of his people, and he speaks to the king, he receives an authorization from the king and goes to Jerusalem. And now in this text, it explains what took place with Nehemiah. And my bread, Jerusalem was a millionaire city. Jerusalem was a city that has, you can say it, is a city that has one of the oldest, one of the oldest cities, historically speaking. Jerusalem has at least, at least 4,000 years of age. Jerusalem comes from the time of Abraham, when Abraham went there to meet with the king Melchizedek, went there to pay the tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek lived in the city called Salem. And then the city became Jerusalem. So Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years, and from Jesus to us, to more 2,000 years. Jerusalem so has at least 4,000 years of age, of existence. It's one of the cities that is, uh, receives most attention in the world. It's one of the most protected cities in the world. Everybody wants Jerusalem. I don't know why. Valadar is there in Brazil. At the disposal for everybody to go there. Nobody goes to Valadares. Everybody wants to move to Jerusalem. Everybody lives in Valadares in Brazil, but they nobody wants to go there. <laughs> and Jerusalem is a city where even to the to our days has at least four thousand years of existence. A city that went through many wars many attacks. Lots of things happened in Jerusalem. It is just to show to the brethren that God has pleasure in restoring what is His. Jerusalem has 4,000 years. And how old are you? God can restore your life. God can give to you what you need, what you want what you are hoping for. The hope of many are being extinguished. 
Now the praise group is going to sing a song, and you, you're going to, we're going to hear a song called Shield. And as the praise group sing a song, I'm going to ask you that you, in your mind, and that you think about something in your life that you thought, well, I can no longer have it. Oh, you cannot say that you're going to win the lottery. You cannot think that you're going to win a lottery. It's not going to work out. But think of think that you need to fix up in your life. I'm going to tell you to a few here. Lack of faith. The lack of fellowship. The lack of intimacy with God. Spiritual thing. I speak of the human side. About hope. Patience. Love. Matrimony. You're going to be in your mind. You're going to put in the author of God what you need for life. Only one thing. At least one thing. And as the group is going to sing, you're going to be praying to the Lord. You and you see that tonight God will restore what you're placing in the altar of God. You're going to leave this place renewed, restored by the power of God.
Glory to Jesus. Holy, holy is the name of the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Glory to God. My brethren, there are many walls here that need to be rebuilt. There are many walls, there are many gates that need to be restored. And God takes pleasure in restoring man's life. You could spend the whole night here asking, what is your problem? What is the wall in your life that needs to be restored? Many what might ask, so my marriage, my personal life, my professional life, my health, my fellowship with God, everything. We could hand the microphone here, and to many here, we have many necessities. Many people there need the resource and the help from God. And you went to here in this place because God wants to do this. God takes pleasure in this. God takes pleasure in blessing, man. God wants to make all things new. In Nehemiah, he saw this. He realized that there was hope for Jerusalem. He realized there was salvation for his people. God Nehemiah trusted a God. He trusted on the Lord. He didn't trust anyone else. He knew that he was an instrument in the hands of God and that he was at the disposal of God for this. But we're not going to speak a lot of the Nehemiah. We speak a lot about Nehemiah. We're going to speak now about another person that also did the same thing that Nehemiah did. Jesus also let go of uh, eternity. He let go of the fortress. He let go of the presence of the Father, where he was being glorified, where he was being exalted by the angels, where he had all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Jesus, who one day also came to the world because he saw in us, he saw in you the walls that need, need to be restored. And Jesus he is here tonight. He is victorious. He is the perfect son. In the moment of darkness, the, mo the moment in which we are living, the moment of misery the world that leaves, the difficult moment in which we are living, Jesus came toward, uh, towards us and he has revealed himself to us. And he, he overcame everything for us. And he, he took upon himself our pains in exchange our sadness to joy. He, he replaced our anguish to joy. He removed, he took upon himself all our sins. And God wants to, to uh, the Lord has shown that people that live in the practice of sin, that's terrible. We are all sinners. But the practice of sin takes men away from the path of salvation. And tonight, God wants to do this. God has shown that a man, three weeks ago, he committed a terrible sin. And to this day, that bothers him. And he's trying in every way to forget, take that away from his mind, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. Only the power of the blood of Jesus. And you need to place this in the altar of God. I hope that you have already placed this on the altar of God. And in this moment here, because that's the reason why God brought you here. The word says, I came so that you have life and life in abundance. Jesus is here in this, this night. He wants to give you what you need. He wants to restore your salvation. He wants to restore the joy in many, the joy of salvation, the joy of the baptisms baptisms of, of the Holy Spirit. He wants to restore the spiritual gifts. And this service has been scheduled in alternative for this because God wants to give an embrace. God wants you to leave this place with your name written in the book of life. God wants you to leave this place with the assurance that you are a citizen of Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. May God bless us. Let us sing a song. What is the song? What is the song? Glory to Jesus.
perfect love. to Jesus. Let us stand up, my brethren. There is nothing that is being lost when there is a God that can do all things. And we are before God that can do all things. I can do all things and on the one who strengthens me. That's the promise of God. Why not God to just saying our words from ourselves. No, those are living words. Those are words from God. Take that with you. It's a promise of God to His servants. It's a promise of God to your life who entered here tonight. So there's nothing that's being missing. For as long as you are trusting God, we're going to have now a word of glorification to the Lord. Mm. 
want to praise you, Lord, for this wonderful word that you have prepared, prepared for each one of us tonight. But we praise you because it's very good, Father, to hear a sweet voice, to hear, Lord, the song that has been sang, that spoke to our hearts, to feel your holy presence in this place. Lord, we praise you because truly we love the Lord. We love to serve you, Lord. We love to be part of your work, Lord. We know that we are not deserving of so great love towards our lives. Because many times we are flawed and imperfect. But you are the one who loves us in an unconditional way. A God is always present with the open arms to embrace your people. To receive us with all your love and care. To offer us a new life, a life of love, a life of peace and joy. Because when we come into your presence, we really know your true face, the true meaning of love. We praise you, Lord, because it's very good to be in your presence. To raise your name high up. We praise you for the hearts that you touched to come to your house tonight to hear from the part of the Lord that the best advice is that we can hear for our lives. That's why we praise the Lord for everything that you have done in our midst and also for everything that you ought to do in our midst because we know that you have a lot more to do, Lord. For those who had placed their needs before your presence, Lord. Because we know that you, we serve a living God, a God of power, a God that can transform everything. That's why we praise you for everything. In the name of Jesus.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Lord God, we are thankful to you for all your deeds. Amen. Beloved Church, my presence is I have I make myself present in your midst because I contemplate your lives. I know your limitations, your desires, your hopes. But what I have for my kingdom is a word that has been ordained from my eternity. The prophetic moment for my church is a moment, is a moment of awakening so that you may place your lives before, before my altar. I want to give you experiences, deep experiences in my presence. I want to speak face to face. I want you to hear my voice. But firstly, your lives need to go through a restoration like it was said in my word, the walls have been falling. They have fallen. And the wall, the gates, they no longer exist. But my church, at this moment, it goes through a, bl a intimate blessing in your lives. You are my sheep. Those are goods that belong to my eternity. And that's why I'm giving to your lives this word. You'll leave my home, my house, completely transformed. You're not going to leave my house in the same way you entered. It's going to be different. Because this is the desire of your God toward your lives. And to you, my son, who is before my author, I now tell you, do not be worried because my blessings have been poured out for my eternity. Beloved Church, open up your lips and proclaim that tonight was a night of victories. Anyways, glory to Jesus. We praise the Lord for your sweet and tender voice that surround us, that bring us to want to be in your presence. That bring us, Lord, to desire to enter through the gates of Jerusalem and never leave. Receive our adoration and give us, Lord, a week of victories in your presence. Is the prayer that we say in the name of Jesus. In your name we say that the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, our eternal Father, the sweet and tender consolations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit be poured out upon us now and forevermore. Amen. The church may sit down. I want to quickly give two announcements. A meeting with the women soon after the assistant and meeting with the, the youth and, and also we are going to have a seminar Saturday and Sunday in Brandon. The youth have been informed as a youth seminar and adolescence. Amen. I want to say the peace of the Lord to everyone. There it is.
the, the, on the, ad, the address, everything is there. Amen. That's, that's where the funeral home found me. I can barely see here. And March 24 is going to be a meeting with the children. Whoever needs uh, a prayer, if you need, we're here at your disposal, deacons, uh, ushers. We are all, we want to say the peace of the Lord to everyone.